Dear Minister Mesa, dear Ambassador Minami, dear Nobel Laureate Professor Honjo, dear Professors Mantovani, Ghibellini, Pelici and Cabral, dear participants, it is my special pleasure to greet you all at the opening of this very important and qualified webinar, Italy-Japan Approaches for Emerging Alternative Cancer Therapy as one of the first activities that I am carrying out as the ambassador designate of Italy to Japan. Let me firstly thank the Italian Minister of University and Research, Maria Cristina Messa, for having accepted to deliver a message to open this important scientific event. I'm also grateful to the Japanese authorities present today and especially to the exceptional panel of scientists that accepted to intervene. This webinar is part of a series organized by the Embassy of Italy through our scientific counselor, Professor Enrico Traversa, in the framework of the 2021 Italian Research Program in Japan. In addition, it is also a concrete initiative developed under the Memorandum of Cooperation in the field of health and medical sciences between the Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare and Italy's Ministry of Health, which was signed last year and which foresees exchanges of best practices and know-how between Italy and Japan in the medical fields. As we all know, the COVID emergencies has overshadowed other illnesses, but we cannot forget the tumors are one of the major causes of death in the world. In Italy and Japan, cancer is responsible for about 28% of annual deaths. And in Japan, cancer is the first cause of mortality. These evidences alone show the highest importance of the current webinar subject. In fact, Italy and Japan two of the most advanced countries in the world for science and technology, have developed very advanced research and investigation on alternative cancer therapies. I am therefore looking forward to hearing our distinguished speakers sharing their knowledge of cancer biological mechanisms and how that can translate into the development of novel advanced therapies. I am sure that this webinar will greatly contribute to a mutual and international understanding of cancer-related studies and their potential application, spurring further collaborations and synergies also with other countries. We will welcome such collaborations and we will do our best to promote and support them as part of our bilateral scientific cooperation program. Please enjoy the webinar I'm sure it will allow a very fruitful discussion, ensure a stimulating learning experience and spark new ideas for future joint projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the ambassador for his uh, uh, welcome. Thank you to everybody. I'm Enrico Traversa, the scientific counselor of, uh, of the embassy of Italy in Japan. And so I would like to start this, uh, this uh, webinar. Um, first of all, I have to say that for, uh, uh, I had to anticipate that for uh, uh, some troubles that Professor Honjo is having today, we need to change the order of the speakers. So Professor Honjo would be the last speakers. And so we will start with Professor Mantovani, then Ghibelli, then Felici, then Cabral, and then finally Honjo. Uh, Enrico, I'm sorry. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt. It seems Professor Honjo is actually here. Oh, really? OK. But, but I mean, I think that probably he's on the train, so maybe his connection is not good. So he, he was probably asking that to, to do also, also to speak as for the last, because he, th later he will reach the hotel and so he will have a better connection. 
Okay. Uh, sorry, this trouble. I just uh, checked in the hotel, but oh. I think, uh, everybody rearranged the order. So I just uh, speak at the end of the conference. Uh, please not oh. uh, rearrange. Yeah. Okay. Please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm joining. So I'm joining the conference. Thank you very much. I'm glad that yeah. you are able at least to solve the problems and to join yeah. us since uh, since the beginning. Right. Uh, but so uh, for uh, for all the attendants, I would like to uh, say that you have also the possibility of giving answer in the chat. I will I will then moderate the round table and I will try to get uh, uh, more space, uh, I mean, space if possible also to, to questions arising from, uh, from the audience. So now I would like uh, uh, to start with the video message of uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Maria Cristina Messa, Minister of uh, uh, University and Research of Italy. Luca, please, can you start the video? Dear Ambassador Minami, dear Ambassador Benedetti, dear Professor Odio, Mantovani, Ghibelli, Pellicci and Cabral, esteemed participants, it is a honor and pleasure for me to present my greetings at the opening of the Italy-Japan Approaches for Emerging Alternative Cancer Therapies webinar organized by the Embassy of Italy in Tokyo under the Italian Research Day in the World 2021 program which is promoted by the Ministry of Research, University and Research in partnership with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. First, I would like to thank the esteemed Japanese authorities attending the webinar and the outstanding speakers that are going to present their research work during this event. Special thanks to Ambassador Benedetti for organizing such an important initiative. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the world, accounting for almost 10 million deaths in 2020. The term cancer is commonly used to refer to a large group of diseases encompassing a variety of multiple mechanisms that are still largely unknown. And the conventional chemotherapy protocols available today in many cases are only temporarily effective or non-effective at all and prove burdensome in patients. This calls for a urgent development of alternative cancer treatments. It is fair to say, however, that substantial progress progress in the scientific research in these past decades has made it possible to reach an increasingly deeper understanding of the biological mechanism behind tumor development, thus contributing to important advancements in fine-tuning the existing cancer therapies for different, from different angles. The Nobel Foundation acknowledged such valuable progress by motivating the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2018 for the discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation. And it is a great honor to have one of those laureates, Professor Tasuku Ojo, as one of the outstanding lecturers in this webinar. The webinar will introduce us to some of the novel concepts behind solutions that may possibly lead to design and deploy more targeted and effective therapies. Concepts like cancer immunotherapy, the importance of the role of tumor microenvironment, reprogramming of cancer tissues, and understanding of molecular mechanism so as to develop alternative cancer therapies, including the application of nanomedicine. Italy and Japan are leaders in these areas, as the upcoming presentation will extensively show. It is my pleasure to extend to all of you my best wishes for a very productive work during the webinar, which I'm confident will also be an incentive for further cooperation between Italy and Japan on cancer-related studies and application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Messa, for these very encouraging words. And now I will leave the 
floor to Ambassador Hiroshi Minami. He's the Deputy Director General for Global Health, Office of Healthcare Co Policy, Cabinet Secretary of the Government of Japan, and the Ambassador for Public Diplomacy, International Economic Affairs and Global Health and at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. So Ambassador Minami, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Her Excellency Ms. Maria Cristina Mesa, Minister of University and the Research of Italy. His Excellency Mr. Gianluigi Benedetti, Ambassador of Italy to Japan. Professor Tasco Honjo, Nobel Laureate, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to be invited to this webinar hosted by the Embassy of, Japan, Embassy of Italy in Japan. At the outset, I would like to start my remarks by Apologies and congratulations. Apologies are from Minister Takayuki Kobayashi, Minister of Science and Technology in, of Japan, who was initially invited to give opening remarks today. But because of the general election campaign of the lower house of the diet in Japan, Minister Kobayashi is unable to attend this webinar. I would like to make this opening remarks on behalf of Minister Kobayashi and convey his best wishes for the success of the event. Congratulations go to Italy and Professor Giorgio Parisi of Sapienza University in Rome, who was awarded this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. As you know, this year, the Nobel Prize in Physics was also awarded to our fellow Japanese, Professor Shukuro Manabe, and we are so proud of the high quality of the scientists of both countries Italy and Japan, that we can share the joy and celebration. Now the International Society is trying to find solutions for serious damages caused by COVID-19. And I would like to highly commend the efforts of Italy as the chair of G20 this year. On the other hand, our attention should not be distracted from other health issues, such as treatment and therapy for cancer, which is the main cause of death in many parts of the world. The topic of today's webinar is extremely meaningful, and I strongly support the efforts and the intention of the Embassy of Italy. In the field of natural science, even though we can have new discoveries or results in researches, it usually takes many years for us to put them into practical use. Researchers have to transform the academic achievements into practical therapies for diseases such as cancer. And to this end, we believe that the academia, industry, and the government should closely work together and coordinate with each other. The Japanese government set out its healthcare policy in the year 2014 and revised in 2020 and its main purpose is the promotion of medical research and development activities, which will contribute to the medical services with the highest standard in the world. Our office, Office of Healthcare, Healthcare Policy of the Cabinet Secretariat, works as headquarters in the government so that the activities by the government ministries concerned should be coherently coordinated from the level of basic research to the level of practical use. In order to promote R&D activities with the highest standard, we need agile and flexible management of the system to cover them. Our office has established a cross-cutting system to manage not only the development of medicines and medical equipment for diseases including cancer, but also projects on genome and data infrastructure and the projects on the development of seas and research base. More concretely, Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development, AMED, which was established in April 2015, has been supporting R&D activities by universities and research institutes and creating better envir environment for R&D. Now, I would like to touch upon alternative cancer therapy, which is the main topic of today's webinar. Traditional cancer therapy, such as operation, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy, 
is highly invasive to patients and sometimes has side effects. Therefore, alternative counter therapy, such as innovative new medicines and new medical equipment, is extremely important from the viewpoints of the improvement of the survival rate and the reduction of the burden on patients. Alternative cancer therapy, such as gene therapy, immunotherapy, and heavy ion radiotherapy is still in the development process in Japan. Based on Japan's healthcare policy, our office is strenuously working to promote R&D so that cancer patients can have access to cutting edge alternative therapy, including the aforementioned therapies at reasonable cost. Today's speakers who are front runner scholars and researchers in the world should feel high expectation and huge pressure from the world. But I sincerely believe that the cooperation between those front runners, other researchers and the governments of the two countries will promote the realization of alternative cancer therapy. I would like to conclude my, my remarks by strongly hoping that cancer will be eradicated to be called a disease in the past and wishing every success of this event. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Minami. We all share your wishes and we really hope that we will be able to, to obtain this extremely important result in the future as close as possible. So now uh, let's move to the uh, scientific talk. So I will start with Professor Alberto Mantovani, uh, that uh, he is the scientific director of the uh, Clinical Institute of Humanitas at the Humanitas University in Milan. And he's, he's also chair of Inflammation and Therapeutic Innovation at the William Harvey Research Institute at Queen Mary University in London. His talk would be on tumor microenvironment. So please, Professor Mantovani. Well, first of all, uh, just a second, I share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, everything is fine. Yeah, well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And I, I should say that I feel like uh, attending a rock, uh, rock music concert. You know, at rock music concerts, there are groups that play and sing before the superstar. And of course, the superstar is fellow and colleague immunologist Tazuko Honjo. And, and I am preparing just warming up the, the field to Tazuko. So that's my duty. So I will focus on, on the tumor microenvironment and uh, macrophages. And, uh, and I want to remind people of the key contribution of a forgotten hero. That's Bob Evans, because Bob is the one who actually formally train formally showed many, many years ago that macrophages or leukocytes in tumors are not tumor cells in disguise, they are bona fide normal cells. Uh, and he also sh showed together with Peter Alexander that macrophages could kill tumor cells. So I had the privilege of working with Bob and Peter, but my views diverged because I started working on uh, real uh, tumors, metastatic and human tumors and found that these cells promoted tumor growth in vitro and in vivo and were attracted by uh, tumor cells. So the general paradigm which emerged uh, is that of a symbiotic relationship between macrophages and tumor cells whereby tumor cells attract macrophages and macrophages serve as tumor cell uh, little helpers. And uh, in general, macrophages have served as a paradigm for the connection between inflammation and cancer, which we like to uh, schematize as, as being uh, consisting of two pathways, an extrinsic pathway whereby inflammatory conditions, for instance, inflammatory bowel disease increases the risk of developing a tumor, 
and an intrinsic pathway whereby genetic events that cause cancer orchestrate the construction of an inflammatory uh, microenvironment. I should say that we had, when we had this review in Nature many, many years ago, uh, this path was not there. But then work that others did, and we did on a genetic, using genetic approaches, showed that the humoral part of innate immunity complement uh, what we call anti-antibodies. And we used this molecule that we cloned many years ago, has shown that the humoral arm of innate immunity also plays an important role in the orchestration of tumor promoting inflammation in the tumor microenvironment. And there is, I, I should say that we have moved from a cancer cell centric view of neoplasia as schematized by uh, Doug Hahn and Bob Wyming at the beginning of the new millennium to one that encompasses inflammation uh, and uh, taming of adaptive immune responses. I should say that I feel that this representation by Dahan and Bob Weinberg is not entirely contacted because the two should be close together because there is a close relationship between the two and this uh, represent a double-edged uh, sword. So back to macrophages, this is Vasily Kandinsky depicting the uh, plasticity of macrophages the one killing tumor cells described by Evans and Alexander, and the alternative forms of macrophage uh, activation that have emerged. And this is a more uh, state of the art picture of the role of macrophages, which promote tumor growth and metastasis by, for instance, promoting tissue remodeling, the metastatic niche, uh, inappropriate skewing of adaptive immune responses towards, for instance, what we call TH17 response, and finally immunosuppression. And here is PDL1. I should emphasize that in many human tumors, for instance, triple negative breast cancer, the main cells that express and trigger immunosuppressors are uh, macrophages in the tumor. Uh, we will hear from the master and commander, Tazuko Honjo, about uh, checkpoints. I want to emphasize that there are myeloids checkpoints. Uh, and uh, the myeloid uh, checkpoint, there are about, I estimate there are about 12 myeloid uh, checkpoints. And there is early data suggesting that uh, some myeloid checkpoints, uh, and here are two, there is early clinical trial data suggesting that it may be valuable to target my, myeloid uh, checkpoint. And one is here, uh, Sirpalfa and CD47, which delivers, and it's downstream of oncogene, which delivers a uh, uh, don't eat me uh, signal. I mentioned the humoral arm of innate immunity, and this was an observation that, uh, genetic observation done in my lab. Again, a double-edged uh, sword, and we have more recently systematically conducted an analysis using a genetic approach of the role of complementing carcinogenesis. Uh, and we had some unexpected finding. The paper is actually now out uh, in Nature Cancer. We found that the lectin pathway uh, drives complement activation and tumor promotion in the methylcholantrin carcinogenesis. I can skip the slides. Targeting complement has the potential to uh, synergize with uh, anti PD1 treatment, so conventional. Uh, checkpoint uh, therapy, and you can come up, as we all do now, with signatures related to complement, which have prognostic activity in an open world, the TCGA database in this particular case, and in our own patients uh, in our own uh, institution. So this is the general message, tumor promoting inflammation, macrophages driving tumor promoting uh, inflammation, complement and an extrinsic concrete suppressor that we described and we cloned uh, years ago, and some unexpected findings, including the lectin pathway being important, uh, and uh, C3A didn't went into the point, but we expected C5A, and we found we stumbled into C5, C3A and its cognate uh, receptor. So again, uh, the diversity of macrophages, we now do run uh, single cell analysis. At the end of my talk, I will briefly mention single cell analysis in uh, human tumor uh, metastasis. So the challenge, of course, as the ambassador said, is uh, translation. And I want to go back again in time 
to a time when uh, there was only one cytokine associated with uh, inflammation and macrophages. And so it, it's IL-1. So we have contributed to dissecting the diversity and complexity of the IL-1 superfamily. We identified the type 2 receptor as a decoy, cloned one of the receptor antagonists, and cloned this fringe member of the family, which if I have time, I will get back to. So it was logical to ask the question, does IL-1 promote cancer? And indeed, uh, many years ago, we found that IL-1 augmented tumor progression. And this was put, put on a firm genetic basis by work of Ronnie Apti, who uh, extended and confirmed our own findings. So over 30 years ago, this is a clinical trial in for atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis, uh, complications of atherosclerosis. It's the Cantos study conducted by Peter Libby and co-worker blocking IL-1. Uh, and uh, the main finding uh, of, of, the, of the study, in my view, is an over 60 or 70 percent reduction in the incidence and mortality from lung cancer. So we now have a better understanding of mechanisms underlying tumor promotion by IL-1 as a macrophage product, including driving differentiation of suppre professional suppressors of adaptive immunity. It plays a role in clonal hematopoiesis. It plays a role in skewing uh, adaptive responses in an appropriate uh, direction. But the reason, the main reason why uh, Cecilia Garland and myself had this uh, radio paper uh, in cancers was well, to convey a message. We think that there is a duty, and uh, look into the future, to conduct a pharmacoprevention study in subjects at high risk for lung cancer. And hopefully by the end of the year, one such study will start in Italy and perhaps in UK. Uh, and uh, let me, to give you the sense, all pharmacoprevention studies have so far failed, but we feel this should be done based on preclinical and clinical evidence. Again, selected subjects. Let me go back to innate immunity and the microenvironment. Macrophages interact with other cells of the innate immune system, in particular NK or uh, innate-like uh, lymphoid cells. And a couple of snapshots. This is a molecule of ours that we cloned, uh, IL-1 R8, is part of the receptor that sees an anti-inflammatory cytokine, a member of the IL-1 family called IL-37, and it behaves uh, this molecule is produced by macrophages, which are dear to our heart. And uh, again, this molecule behaves as a checkpoint uh, in NK cells, and we now have evidence in T cells. Again, and I, I'm showing this, this work to, to pay tribute to the work done by Tada Taniguchi. Tada <laughs> did work many years ago showing that there is a pathway of resistance uh, to metastasis, which is mediated by a dialogue between macrophages and NK cells. We rep reproduced TADAS data 100%, but then we were interested in a molecule again that comes up, came up from our pipeline expressed in macrophages. It's a core receptor for innate immunity receptor. It's important for sensing fungi, tumors, and uh, interestingly enough, there is a strong genetic association with an inflammatory disease, uh, which is a matter of concern for all of us, uh, neurodegeneration. Finally, all of us, uh, again, uh, in it like lymphoid cells, these are T cells, but unconventional T cells, double negative T cells, and uh, work again done in my lab by, by Ponzetta and, and, and others in my lab has shown that in selected tumors, mouse tumors and human tumors, there is a tripartite interaction between macrophages, neutrophils, and these unconventional uh, T cells endowed with innate immunity receptors that drive, can drive resistance. And general message, we are all doing single cell analysis. This is sing probably the first single cell analysis of double negative unconventional T cell in a relevant human tumor. And I think that the challenge is, uh, as in this painting by Georges Seurat, to see the Tour Eiffel among the individual uh, points. Final message, I think I'm still in my time. Yes, I have plenty of time. Uh, we have long known that macrophage infiltration is associated with poor prognosis. We, I, I have known that for uh, uh, 
longer than I like to recall. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, some recent data of ours. Here is a clinical problem. This is uh, liver metastasis from colorectal cancer. A good surgeon, and actually our surgeon in our institution, Guido Torzilli, trained in Japan. So he is uh, 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 very strong. He speaks Japanese and he's very strong ties with Japan again. And uh, he, uh, his young surgeon, uh, his young colleague is Matteo Donadon. He is a, a young surgeon. Uh, and uh, these surgeons can um, handle about 25, 30% of the patients with liver metastasis. So the surgeon can cure a fraction of them, but they don't know who are going to be saved by the surgeon. So this is the clinical problem. So we looked at macrophages and we did what all of us do. On the one hand, we did uh, RNA sequence analysis, single cell analysis, but then uh, Matteo and the pathologist told me that there were differences in morphology. And although, of course, I have known for, for ages that macrophages with different forms of activation uh, look different. And so we develop an in, in, uh, uh, artificial intelligence approach to quantify morphology of macrophages uh, uh, and found that this is associated with lipid metastasis, with complement, with inflammation. Uh, and the general message is that uh, low, uh, low cost, simple, IA-driven technology, uh, assessing macrophage morphology under these conditions can serve as a strong correlate of function down to single cell analysis with very strong prognostic significance. And I think that this is one of the challenges that we have. In other words, using state-of-the-art technology but then uh, translation and translation with technologies can, can be handled at the bedside. So this is the picture of my group at work, and this is my role in, uh, in the efforts over this year. These are the young fellows doing the work, and this is the acknowledgement of my funding uh, sources. And once more, thank you for the privilege of being spiritually in Japan with you. Thank you very much, Professor Mantovani, for this very uh, inspiring talk and so for your uh, early work in uh, giving a strong contribution in trying to understand what's behind uh, tumors and how we can handle them for possible treatment. So I will give the floor now to uh, Lina Ghibelli, Professor Lina Ghibelli from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. She will talk about reprogramming cancer tissue as emerging therapies, anachoinosis. Please, Lina. Lina, you're muted. Okay, so good morning again. Do you see my screen? Yes, everything is fine. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, the organizer the, uh, uh, who conceived, organized this meeting, uh, um, giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, and present anachronosis uh, that is an, as an emergency conceptually novel anti-cancer therapy. Uh, Sorry, some problems in with my PowerPoint. I... You you have to click on the on the on the PowerPoint, and then it will move. Yes, yes, of course, but it's well. This is my usual way of making lessons, but it's for some reasons is not working. And okay, let me go. Okay, okay, so. Uh, this is the, uh, what the organizer of the meeting uh, asked us to do, to address uh, how can we find uh, alternative to 
the current therapies that have present high problems of toxicity. That is something that is uh, uh, generally known by, you know, by patients. Uh, but there is other things that are very important and are of course not known to specialists, but not to um, perhaps not to the uh, um, general public. That is the frequent promotion of relapse from the therapy after the temporary remission. Uh, this, uh, the new therapies, for example, the molecular target therapy that uh, really can prevent the high toxicity. Uh, however, they do not have any uh, ability to um, uh, act on the relapse as uh, amply shown by, by, by the literature. So this means that uh, 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 we have to find alternatives because cells surviving cytotoxic therapy actually react and, had, and adapt to the heart condition and uh, they set up tissue defense pathways aimed at repopulation. Now, I won't go into the molecular details because this is not the, 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 the point, but how is this reaction uh, uh, achieved? There are stress responses very well studied that aim at uh, uh, block the normal life of the cell, the normal metabolism, repair the damage, then shut off and allow re, re, uh, uh, the, the normal uh, homeostasis to uh, be back. And then there is, these are cell, uh, uh, um, for cell protection, but there are pathways that are uh, emerging like the uh, compensative proliferation pathways where the tissue reacts. So it regains uh, the number of cells lost during the stress uh, by uh, uh, an apoptosis promoter repopulation. This was called by Professor Lee Penix Rising and there is consistent literature, also still a niche literature, but there is consistent literature on, on, on this. What is the point? That in normal tissue, the, such responses uh, are perfect. They rapidly repair, they are shut off, and the homeostasis is back. What happens in cancer? In cancer repair for reasons that are still obscure, is impaired. There is the stress responses chronify and stabilize the stress condition. The phoenix rising that is a good, very good thing. Otherwise, we would be full of holes in our life. Uh, in is absorbed by cancer in a, a, a exaggerated way, leading to strong inflammation. What, these conditions, all these uh, uh, effects uh, um, leads uh, to a strong reaction, epigenetic reprogramming, and the very famous word that is epithelial to metastatization, metastatization, acquire resistance uh, to uh, uh, further therapy, and all accelerate tumor progression. There is something that I really want to say, uh, uh, adaptation, rather than genetic selection are responsible for such phenomena. And they are draggable because they are phenomena that are uh, uh, taking place. Uh, mm, well, I, uh, for brevity, I, I had to coin uh, rapidly a, a, a term because uh, all these things are connected and the effect to be uh, real important for tumor progression need to occur in a coordinated way. So for brevity, I created this cancer population and acquired cell resistant uh, acronym that is CRAC that I will use in the, in the uh, proceeding of the, of the talk. So all these limit, uh, uh, these are intrinsic limit uh, uh, to the conventional strategies. In situation where molecular tissue dynamics overrules tumor cell autonomous response, and uh, uh, um, likely uh, Professor Mantovani uh, uh, is uh, uh, open the, the way to this. And so I don't need to convince you that uh, the tumor microenvironment and the cross talk between all the objects present in the tissue microenvironment play a, a fundamental role in uh, work in, uh, in cancer. So uh, it is becoming evident to oncologists that targeting the wrong objects within uh, uh, the tumor microenvironment elicit cancer tissue reaction with increased aggressiveness. 
For example, the really intriguing uh, phenomenon of hyperproliferation that follows therapies, even therapies that are not toxic, like the uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors in therapy that, we all, uh, that is, uh, Professor Honcho will uh, uh, describe uh, later. So what can we do? Can uh, we prevent relapsing by influencing, sorry, the, 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 the normal word, but it's uh, something that needs to be coined um, influencing molecular tissue dynamic uh, by tissue editing, correcting tissue, rather than targeting specific targets, even targets not uh, necessarily the, the, the cancer cells, but targets present in the tumor microenvironment. So uh, uh, um, we envision two uh, uh, um, logically two uh, approaches. We can com complement the traditional therapy, also the cytotox, even the cytotoxic therapy by uh, blocking crack, so to have a crack-free chemotherapy, or as a totally different strategy, using non-cytotoxic bio biomodulatory therapy, that is anachronosis. So anachronosis is from the Greek, that means communication, and me, uh, um, aims at correcting cancer tissue homeostasis without direct toxicity. Uh, this was, uh, uh, the term was coined and the idea was totally by uh, Professor Wrightley, whom I met in a uh, meeting in Korea in 2015. Uh, and this uh, uh, pushed me to, uh, to, to go into a new perspective, give me a new perspective. And, and uh, so that I decided to address this point uh, uh, and to, uh, um, to address my research in this, in this point. So uh, adenoquinosis was uh, uh, first uh, uh, ideated as a palliative care for refractory or untreatable patients. But then Professor Reichley discovered that it, it was doing more. That is, it was uh, uh, acting as an anti-cancer therapy. So let's uh, uh, go through the, uh, rapidly to the facts of anaquinosis. 15 clinical trials uh, organized by Professor Reichle on 15 different types of tumors. Pharmacological treatment. The idea is to use a cocktail drugs consisting mainly of biomodulators, like a specific and unspecific transcriptional uh, uh, reactivator uh, agents, and COX inhibitor, that is a, a kind of mantra in, in uh, becoming a kind of mantra in anti, the new anti cancer therapy, plus other treatments, uh, uh, including immunocheckpoint inhibitors and metronomic schedule to induce plasticity in the, in the cells. And the drugs, evidently, evidently because it's uh, evidence based, uh, uh, act on tissue mass regulator on hubs of cell communication, or either act pleiotropically and hitting multiple targets, being themselves uh, master modulators. Results uh, are very strong because uh, on, on the thousand and more patients treated, 60% metastatic patient response, some even going to continuous complete remission since many years and long-term tumor-free survival. Other point uh, important, low risk uh, uh, for patients, biomodulators are not toxic, this is known, but they seem not to act on the uh, 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 normal basic uh, homeostasis of the healthy tissue. And this is uh, sustainable economically because the drugs are all approved and used in cancer therapy. And there is a big attention on drug repurposing. Now, what are the mechanisms? This is a paper we published uh, last year, just uh, um, describing the effects. Of course, I won't go into the details, but uh, uh, summarizing. Uh, anachronosis aims at remodeling metastatic tumors by therapeutically accessible communication. This is important, therapeutically accessible, means that now it's feasible and the results show that. Uh, to note, clinical responses can be achieved without therapeutically targeting the mutation in cancer. The uh, general idea is that uh, the, in the cancer microenvironment, tumor and stroma cells can be a target, not directly, uh, but they may be uh, induced to change their behavior by re restoring a more uh, uh, physiological uh, uh, crosstalk. And the results, the objective results are obtained very, very rapidly. 
the mechanism of anachronosis, uh, uh, in, in, in detail, in a, a little more detail. So anachronosis need to act on the microenvironment and correct cell-cell and cell matrix communication or the way cells respond to the signal rather than hitting wrong objects present in DT in A. Uh, correct at various extent the aberrant cancer tissue homeostasis, and this is uh, uh, an important goal, reacquisition of apoptosis and differentiation competence by cancer cells. But there is something that is uh, very important that also can normalize cancer cells independently of oncogenes. So clinical remission is obtained even in the presence, in the, even if the molecular and cellular tumor signal remain in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the patient. So normalization of cancer cells in spite of oncogenes is a long story. It began in the 70s by the work of Beatrice Mintz, who normalized cancer cells uh, by injection in the blastocyst of, of mice, uh, these cells uh, undergo normal differ the differentiated and undergo the normal differentiation uh, participating to all tissues. And the studies were repeated a few years ago in the zebrafish with similar results. How is this possible? There are the, the scientific prerequisites for this. Yes, it is the tissue that regulates the expression of oncogenes. There is a, a huge now production in the, in the last months of Martin Corena papers who by single cell sequencing could show that normal tissues, especially in the elders, uh, uh, contain many mutations, well, se several mutations in the oncogenes that however are uh, kept at bay by tissue organization because these tissues are not uh, uh, cancer, are not pre tumor, are not pre tumor lesion, are perfectly histologically normal tissues. Uh, 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 an idea of how this can happen is from this paper of a few years ago of Clefstrom, uh, uh, who showed that uh, the epithelial organization can keep at bay the oncogenic protein pro properties of CMIC that is expressed but is not pro-oncogenic. So uh, this means that uh, this means that uh, uh, the tissue has uh, the ability to control uh, this because destroying the, the, the architecture of the tissue, CMIC automatically express the oncogenic activity. So the functional unit is the tissue and is not, is not the cell. And the continuous flux or information between the different entities of, of the tissues modulates intracellular gene expression, that is a response to the loss of the tissue rather than a cell autonomous choice. So tumor suppressive pathways that are absent uh, uh, in culture lacking the organization uh, um, suggest that epithelia can include, exploit and keep in check cells with mutated oncogenes. And this is the principle of anachronosis. This is conceivably the principle of anachronosis. So how to proceed now? We start from uh, uh, clinical evidence. So we have to go from bed to bench top uh, and we can uh, exploit the innovative techniques uh, uh, to address the molecular tissue dynamics, things that we could not do since uh, a few years ago where we are limited to the, uh, uh, in the uh, preclinical study to the studied the cells, the cell behavior. So we have the 3D culture, lab on chip devices, in vivo imaging, single cell sequencing, imaging mass cytometry to say some. And these are really necessary to reveal a more modern and complex view of cancer as uh, Professor Mantovani already showed with examples. Now, let me uh, uh, use the last minutes uh, to introduce a very pioneering thing. And this is my experimental, I'm a, bio, I'm a cell biologist, not a clinician, so my uh, contribution to um, CRAC. This is pioneer field, and this about the cancer repopulation and acquired cell resistance. Uh, is it possible to have a, a CRAC-free chemotherapy using the anachronosis paradigm? So we set up a novel in vitro model that mimic a monostratified epithelium large, uh, such as prostates, uh, performing long-term observation uh, of prostate cancer cells 
upon consecutive treatments with clinical relevant drugs. So in vivo, in vitro experiments. So this is the kinetics. You see the curve with cells that, uh, with, uh, which, uh, whose number decreases uh, uh, and then uh, uh, re, uh, regrows. Uh, and so we define, uh, we uh, um, treat the cells for 24 hours, after which we observe an apoptosis phases, a quiescence phases, and a repopulation phases. Of course, the, the first is a stress response, apoptosis senescent, but cells begin organizing. The second is quiescent in, in terms of number of cells, but it's extremely important and active, and this is the origin of the repopulation. Cells have high organizational activity, extreme motility, and shape plasticity, trans differentiations, epigenetic reprogramming. Then the repopulation phase consists of clonal growth of very, very few cells that are actually next generation cells. And repopulation requires caspase activation. This is phoenix rising. Epigenetic reprogramming because azacitidine and valproic acid prevent repopulation. And extremely high level of uh, prostaglandin uh, E2 and aspirin and other COX-2 inhibitors prevent repopulation. Uh, so uh, surprisingly, we were very much surprised that uh, the surviving prostate cancer cells are able to self-organize into a tissueoid to cope with the insult. And they uh, um, uh, express extra epithelial functions resembling stroma including trans-differentiation events, uh, for example, to adipocytes. So it's, it looks like these pure, purely epithelial cells try to reconstruct a tumor microenvironment, a complex tumor microenvironment. And this is how a cell can uh, uh, become from the small cells in the top that is in the untreated to huge cells with protrusion. They, uh, the, the time lapse sees a huge activity of cells touching and communicating. Uh, this is uh, um, the repopulating cells different from the original. For example, they form larger organoids in 3D cultures. Other features are the uh, acquisition of epidemic segment transition, focused locomotion, matrix degradation, significantly increased resistance to a second uh, uh, um, versus the first chemotherapy treatment. Interestingly, each clone reprogram independently on the other and different one of each other, uh, indicating phenotypic heterogeneity. And if we pull the clones, this exacerbated the malignant features. To note, one tenth of the clones uh, transactivate embryo pathways, for example, the nano. So it shows that crack depends on active cell cell communications within the microenvironment. The normal cells, the uh, um, cancer, uh, so the non-cancer prostate cells uh, treated the same way. They repopulate, fortunately, but they do not acquire resistance, do not undergo uh, a, a EMT, do not acquire focused locomotion, have a limited or essential increase in, in uh, prostaglandin, but important, they do not depend on epigenetic rearrangements. So post-therapy repopulation, differs in the cancer versus non-cancer cells. So it means that normal cells do not undergo crack to repopulate. They can repair and repopulate perhaps cell autonomously without essential change. So uh, inhibition of genetic reprogramming by azacitidine and valproic acid, as I showed before, as I told before, prevent repopulation. What happens if we remove the inhibitor, for example, after one week? This allows a slow repopulation rate, but the cells that repopulate in these conditions have no acquired resistance, have no or poor epithelial to mesenchymal transition, have no or poor, undergo no or poor crack. This is important because it looks like the mortality of repopulation in this inhibitor switched from the uh, cancer to the normal, not exactly, of course, but is more likely. Uh, so it suggests that a precise and short time window of therapy exists where stress cells uh, seem losing the ability to, product to, to productively reprogram and undergo crack. So in, the, in those cases, repopulation occurs without increased malignancy. So is, would 
this, this be a way of achieving, achieving durable remission, preventing or at least, at least reducing therapy-induced tumor uh, um, relapse. Uh, of course, this is something that has to be validated uh, in vivo. Uh, and we, are, we really hope that we can contribute to uh, uh, cancer therapy by trying to uh, achieve a um, uh, co-treatment that may stabilize uh, uh, the success of chemotherapy. So I think uh, the problem is representing. Okay, last slide. Just uh, to, to tell you that uh, anachronosis, we are a, a, a growing community uh, still uh, at the beginning. We organized a couple of meetings, uh, international meeting. Uh, uh, was uh, uh, concealed by, uh, by COVID. Uh, uh, we hope to have the third conference uh, in uh, next September. And we have a team that is already uh, uh, with some specialists already recruited and others uh, still to recruit. I hope today I can uh, have some addition. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the attention. This uh, contributors for the anachronosis is a consolidated thing that is uh, uh, um, guided by Professor Reitley. And the crack uh, that we, uh, I organized, uh, especially in my, in my department, but we uh, have uh, increasing number of um, people of science, of colleagues that participate and help us in this task. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gibelli, for this uh, uh, very uh, interesting and uh, somehow a novel uh, uh, talk. And can you please, uh, okay. Uh, so now I move to the next talk, which, uh, which is by uh, Professor Pier Giuseppe Pellicci, Director of Research at the European Institute of Oncology in Milan. And he will talk us about the molecular mechanism of cancer for alternative therapies. Please, Professor Pellicci. Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to this webinar. I'm really privileged with so recognized scientists and colleagues. So thank you very much. I guess you, you do see my screen and you hear me, right? We see your screen and we hear you, but the screen is not in. OK, now it's fine. Thank you. OK. Um, so again, thanks a lot for the, for the invitation. Um, as mentioned by my previous speakers, uh, oncology has been revolutionized in the last 20 years by the introduction of uh, a new treatment approach, which is uh, based on uh, recogni recognition of uh, molecular mechanisms underlying the tumor development and targeting, specific targeting of those mechanisms. I'm reporting in this first slide what I think is the first example which I had the privilege to contribute to, which sets the conceptual flow of this novel approach. This is a rare acute leukemia, the promethocytic leukemia. The first step is the understanding of the uh, mechanism underlying initiation and maintenance of this leukemia. And you see on the left of the slide, I mean, we identify the leukemia oncogen, a translocation product, PML or alpha, and decipher the, the molecular mechanisms uh, of this oncogen, which is heterochromatin formation that target genes, genes which are involved in induction of terminal differentiation. So the oncogen induces transcriptional repression and differentiation block, which is at the basis of the leukemia. We then identified the uh, targeting drug, so, uh, which was the natural ligand of one piece of this oncogen, and which given at uh, retinoic acid, which given at uh, pharmacological concentration, completely reversed the transcriptional repressive activity of the oncogen, thus releasing the transcriptional repression effect on target genes and induction and inducing a, of uh, terminal differentiation. 
So the next step was very obvious, that of trying that uh, drug, that ligand as a drug in combination with chemotherapy. And as you can see on the right uh, panel, the disease which was invariably fatal became curable with a combination of chemotherapy plus retinoic acid. And in the following years, uh, I mean, uh, thanks to an Italian work, uh, the um, chemotherapy has been substituted with another targeting drug, arsenic acid, and now basically this disease can be cured without uh, chemotherapy, only used uh, using uh, uh, targeting drugs. So since then, many other flurry of new uh, mechanism-based drugs have been introduced, which have completely radically changed the natural history of different tumor types. I put on these slides lung cancer as an example. On the left, you see real-world data for uh, patients uh, treated with the chemotherapy with unfortunately median survival no longer than not, not higher than eight months with the introduction of targeting drug and checkpoint inhibitor as we we'll hear at the end by professor onio i mean uh, the situation changed dramatically using for example an ike inhibitor in uh, lung cancer showing uh, this specific uh, translocation, there is 40% survival at four years. Using a GF receptor inhibitor, there is 30% survival in 18 months. And using a checkpoint inhibitor, for example, the PEMBRO in patients with more than 50% PDL1, there is something like 40% survival, which is really amazing. Mm -hmm. There are, however, a number of challenges which are emerging. Sorry, that okay. From the usage of these uh, uh, mechanism-based drugs, which I guess will set the agenda of cancer research for the next decades. The first one is pretty, pretty known. So resistance clearly dominates over sensitivity. And in fact, it is very frequent to observe both primary and secondary resistance. For example, in the target therapy, as mentioned, there is a very high response rate. However, almost invariable, the patients relapse of resistant disease. And in the case of checkpoint inhibitors, we observe both primary and secondary resistance at different rates, depending on the tumor type. For example, in the case of metastatic metanoma, 40-50% of patients show primary resistance and 30% of the responders during over time experience progression. So, secondary resistance. And I guess a second challenge which is clearly emerging is that we don't know how to treat metastatic disease. Still, metastatic disease represents the main cause of cancer-related death, more than 90%. And the metastatization is more and more understood as molecularly distinct for tumor growth. Fortunately, the drugs that we use to, to treat the um, metastatic process or the metastases themselves are those which have been selected in preclinical study for their activities on primary tumor growth. So as mentioned by previous speaker, an alternative approach might be that of uh, targeting uh, non-generic responses, so-called uh, adaptive responses of cancer cells to try modulating survival and or drug sensitivity. And this is based on emerging evidence, which uh, from many labs, we show that drug resistance and metastatization are both the results of cancer cells to change dynamically their phenotype, the, what we call uh, adaptation in response to environmental uh, perturbations. So in other terms, these cells can change phase and generate uh, a great degree of intratumoral heterogeneity. So different perturbations have been characterized as being able to, ad to induce adaptive uh, 
phenotypes. Some come from the tumor macroenvironment, for example, nutrient oxygen deprivation or inflammatory signals uh, specifically characterized for TNF, TGF, beta interference and the treatments themselves or from the inside the cells, mainly damage, oxidative stress or unfolding proteins. And as mentioned, these perturbation are able to activate a number of adaptive mechanisms. Basically, the cells, the, the cancer cells, like normal cells, are able to mount a response to this perturbation. And uh, it is pretty known, the, the molecular machinery which mediates this response is called integrated stress response, which then induce a, a profound reprogramming of transcription, protein translation, and metabolism. Some of these adaptive phenotypes have been characterized and uh, shown to confer invasion metastasis and grand drug resistance properties. For example, the EMT in the epithelial cancer of the proliferative to invasive switch in melanomas. Simply as an example, uh, I want to mention, for example, uh, the long non coding uh, RNA tinker that we have just recently published, which is a suppressor of this pathway in, uh, in melanoma. And in fact, uh, its loss activates uh, the uh, integrated stress response and favors metastasis and drug resistance, the two phenotypes together in melanoma. And mechanistically, uh, this uh, long long coding RNA it interacts with RNA of the invasive phenotype, including ATF4, which is uh, a, a critical transcription factor of this pathway, preventing their binding to, to ribosomes. So this is a, a natural pathway which protects cells for this, uh, this transition. So what I would like to do very quickly uh, is to share a, a yet unpublished story where we try to ask the question whether we can eradicate indeed tumors by inhibiting the adaptation of cancer cells to the harsh microenvironment, hypoxia and nutrient deprivation. I will present the work of Rani Pallavi and Luca Mazzarella in my lab. So the model system that we used is myeloid leukemias and the experimental condition to induce uh, um, uh, nutrient deprivation is caloric restriction. All the experiments have been done uh, in vivo. Okay, so caloric restriction, uh, if, if you caloric restrict a mouse which uh, uh, carry, uh, for example, a human tumor or a mouse tumor or whatever, uh, caloric restriction induces uh, moderate apoptosis and uh, transient uh, uh, cell cycle arrest. And the results of this effect is a slight modest increase in the survival of the mice, as you see the mice die later of, uh, of the disease. However, this effect uh, as, uh, of caloric restriction, tumor growth, as you see here, is uh, transient. And in fact, after a few weeks, the leukemia re explode. We try to characterize uh, this phenomenon. So initial response and then relapse, sorry. And what we found that this is due to the selection during uh, the first phase of treatment of uh, leukemic, uh, leukemia stem cells, which are the cells which are responsible for growth in leukemia. You see, there is a tenfold increase of the frequency of leukemia stem cells. These leukemia stem cells thus becomes adapted to the caloric restriction. This adaptation is clearly reversible if you retransplant it into non-caloric restricted mice um, is lost. And there is no selection of DNA mutation that confer increased fitness to the leukemia stem cells. So bottom line is that the caloric restriction, energy deprivation induces an adaptive phenotype in leukemic uh, stem cells uh, by which then those cells which become 
adapted to the energy deprivation are responsible for the leukemia growth. Okay, so we tried uh, making the story very short to identify which are the chromatin mediators of this uh, adaptation. And uh, we focused on uh, LSD1, which is a lysine specific uh, demethylase, which uh, allows for uh, transcription reprogramming, which as you can see here is upregulated by caloric restriction. So it's targeted by caloric restriction. We had developed in, in the past years a specific inhibitor, a small compound of this uh, chromatin enzyme. Uh, DDP338, which we used to inhibit LSD1, asking the question, if we inhibit adaptation in leukemia stem cell, do we uh, block tumor growth? The results are shown here. If we add LSD1 to the caloric restricted uh, leukemias in vivo, you see that the leukemia goes down. There is massive apoptosis. And more importantly, the leukemia is basically eradicated. You see that after more than one year, the uh, all 100% of mice remain, remain alive, thus suggesting that inhibition of LSD1 induces disease eradication. We then study the molecular mechanism of the adaptation and the LSD1 inhibition effect. And uh, what we found uh, very in uh, interestingly is that the, the mechanism through which cells adapt, cancer cells adapt to uh, energy deprivation is by down-regulating the double-strand RNA mediated innate immune response. You know that when cells are infected, no matter whether by DNA or RNA virus, during the life cycles of the infection, they generate double-strand RNA. And the double-strand RNA is sensed by the infected cells to activate a number of pathways, two in particular, one which involves RNA cell, which leaves, which then allows for the degradation of the viral RNA, and the other one activation of the interferon response, which is antiviral. As, uh, as, uh, as uh, an effect uh, leading to apoptosis. So in normal cells, uh, in non-infected cells, sorry, this part is activated by double-strand RNA, which is formed as consequence of transcription of endogenous retro elements. So caloric restriction dramatically down-regulates double-strand RNA formation, a number of proteins, almost all of them, uh, which sense the double-strand RNA, which bind double-strand RNA and the trigger the response, and it, now, it dampens down the uh, interferon pathway, thus reducing uh, apoptosis. And this mediates the adaptation of the leukemic stem cells to the energy deprivation. And uh, LSD1 inhibition just does the opposite. So it, it dramatically activates double-strand RNA formation, probably, uh, transcript and probably levels of uh, double-strand RNA sensors and mediators of the interferon, specific mediators of the interferon uh, response, thus inducing a massive uh, apoptosis. Uh, then to make it uh, uh, treatable in terms of uh, uh, cancer therapy, we try to map uh, the pathways uh, uh, activated by caloric restriction. And we found that we can mimic both in vivo and in vitro caloric restriction with uh, inhibition of insulin IGF-1 receptor signaling, which is one of the pathways, which is classically classic pathway, which is inhibited by caloric restriction. So basically, the combination IGF-1 receptor inhibition using a small compound and LSD-1 inhibition eradicates these leukemias. So this is a cartoon where I just summarized this hypothesis. So basically what we show that in this particular leukemia, energy deprivation induces adaptation by dampening 
double strand RNA signaling, which is critical for disease progression. Inhibition of this pathway uh, reverse the effect on double strand RNA signaling and leads to massive apoptosis of leukemia stem cell, thus uh, uh, leading to the disease eradication. Probably this approach might involve also regulation of uh, drug sensitivity. And in fact, uh, in Minucci's group, which is here in our department, uh, Saverio has characterized, uh, for example, the, the mechanism of adaptation of melanoma cells to a specific uh, uh, cell cycle inhibitor. This is uh, uh, palbociclib, which is a CDP4, CD66 inhibitor. You see melanoma in vivo are resistant to this uh, inhibitor. However, and, and because they select the uh, remanent population, uh, which is uh, um, capable of entering quiescence. However, if, if, if when he added this, the same LSD1 inhibitor, as you can see, there is uh, complete uh, prevention of, uh, uh, of melanoma growth. I guess, however, we should expect a much more complicated picture because uh, it is possible that different tumors, different mount uh, molecularly distinct uh, responses. For example, uh, here we screened uh, breast cancer for their sensitivity to caloric restriction and uh, disease eradication by LSD1 inhibition. As you can see, this particular case is a case where LSD1 is the mediator, probably is targeted by caloric restriction and dramatic upregulation. In this case, there is no effect. And only in this case, there is a profound effect on tumor growth, while in the case where LSD1 is not upregulated, the LSD1 inhibitor does basically nothing. This is to say that uh, we might expect a great deal of heterogeneity in the molecular mechanism that should be targeted. And uh, this correlates with uh, some findings uh, that we published uh, I guess a couple of see, a couple of years ago, where we asked this question basically. I mean, if we in an unbiased way we screen for chromalin uh, mediators, for example, in melanomas, screen for genes which are indispensable for tumor growth, we found a lot, really a lot of chromatin, um, chromatin modifiers that by in vivo screens clearly are indispensable for tumor growth. And, uh, but the, uh, the, the common, uh, uh, sorry, the common uh, uh, genes are very unfrequent among different patients, you see only basically 15 to 20% of the genes are in common between different patients. And more strikingly, none of these genes is mutated in these cases. So again, suggesting that the non-generic adaptive response might be tackled as well and even more efficiently in tumors. I mean, we validated some of them, but the point I don't want to enter into details, the point I want to make is that, for example, one of these, which is an histone methyl transferase, uh, induces a reprog transcription and reprogramming by acting with a specific enhancer. Well, this is true only, for example, in NRAS mutated melanoma, while in the BRAF mutated, it has no role. So what I'm saying is probably genetically distinct tumors are able to mount different adaptive responses, thus suggesting that we should expect again a lot of variability. The last slide is just to show some preliminary data which suggests that the same pathway um, stress pathway that I mentioned might be also responsible for metastasis as expected in my opinion. We did here a single cell tra tracing of transcriptional uh, landscapes during the metastatization of human breast cancer. So basically human breast cancer is monitored during, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, during metastatization at single cell level and we monitor, monitor the transcriptional landscape. And the results are pretty surprising. Only very few cells 
in the primary tumor, less than 0.1% are capable of the forming metastasis. So it's not true that those cells can do it. Only a few of them can do it. And uh, this is true for different tumors. And uh, we validated the genes which are responsible for that in many cases. But the nice, the, the, the critical thing is that when we analyze what makes different cells which are able to metastasize and one which is not in terms of transcriptional deregulation, what we found is that those few cells have uh, upregulation of genes of the interferon response and the interaction with the extracellular matrix, thus suggesting that that same pathway might also be not only conferring uh, drug resistance and uh, providing a survival factor in the harsh environmental condition of the tumors, but also promoting uh, metastasis. So that's my conclusion. I guess these data suggest that the leukemia cells are capable to adapt to energy deprivation by now regulating the double strand RNA immunity signaling, and that there is a possibility to, to inhibit that adaptation, for example, by LSD1 inhibition. And this might lead to disease eradication or a modification of, sensi of uh, drug sensitivity. I think, however, that the preliminary data suggests that uh, this might be very different patient to patient or tumor type to tumor type to say that, uh, and this might depend on the genetic makeup of those tumors. In other terms, different genotypes might exert a different type of adaptive responses, which open up the uh, possibility of uh, doing, uh, of, uh, I mean, mapping a patient-specific adaptive response as uh, an approach for future therapies. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Pellicci, for this uh, gave for another aspect of the search for a specific mechanism for uh, uh, cancer therapies uh, and uh, also the difficulties, as you said at, at the end, that because the cancer is such a, uh, a wide variety of different uh, behavior, different mechanisms, that it's very difficult to find a single silver bullet we need to find more approaches for various types of tumors. So now we change a little bit the topic. So we need also to treat the uh, cancer. And so we have also to deliver drugs. And so we are now having Professor Horacio Cabral from uh, the Department of Bioengineering of the University of Tokyo. And he will talk to us about uh, the approaches of nanomedicine for tumor immunotherapy. So Horacio, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Traversa, for your kind introduction and also for the kind invitation to introduce our research in this uh, fantastic webinar. Um, so I would like to present our recent approaches for using nanomedicine for uh, tumor immunotherapy. And uh, basically by using nanomedicine, we aim to uh, improve the uh, efficacy and uh, safety of drugs. So when we administer drugs, either immunotherapeutic agents or chemotherapy agents, they will systemically distribute and cause toxicities and uh, maybe inactivate it in the body or achieve low accumulation at the target sites, which will require increased dosing uh, uh, that will further improve the, increase the toxicities. So in our approach, we will use some uh, carriers that can directly deliver the cargo to the disease site and increase uh, the accumulation at the target position. So by using this nanomedicine approach, we can also protect the loaded drugs, reduce toxicities, and uh, hopefully enhance uh, the therapeutic efficacy of the loaded drugs. So our group has been working on polymeric mysos, which has been a pioneer by Professor Kasunori Kataoka in the late 80s. And 
Since then, uh, we have been able to introduce different type of uh, payloads for uh, directing them to tumor tissues. So we can load um, small molecules, nucleic acids or proteins into spherical coarser structures directed by self-assembly through weak forces between a drug loading block and the payloads. Besides, we can provide these nanoparticles, uh, a dense hydrophilic shell that will protect the payload in the core and also uh, prevent the interactions with biomolecules in the biological environments. In addition, we can have the surface modified with a specific ligands that will promote the engagement of these delivery systems uh, with particular cell populations and tissues. So our early work has shown that the polymeric micelles is a uh, very efficient uh, delivery carrier for uh, anti-cancer drugs and uh, other type of payloads into tumors. Uh, so for example, the small size of the polymeric micelles allow us to have deep penetration, not only in hyperpermeable tumors, but also in hypopermeable tumors like pancreatic cancer uh, with a very dense fibrotic stroma. So for example, in this case, we label our nanoparticle with two different fluorescents. And we label the big particles with red fluorescence and the small particles with green fluorescence. And we can see that by controlling the size, we can achieve deep penetration into tumor tissues. Besides by dynamically tracing the particles in the bloodstream, we found other mechanisms of tumor accumulation, which we uh, term vascular burst, and they occur dynamically throughout the tumor vasculature to promote the accumulation of uh, larger scale uh, nanoparticles. In addition, we can modify the surface of our drug delivery systems with ligands that, it, that can recognize the material cells in tumors to promote uh, a transcytosis effect. So the nanoparticles will be recognized by the endothelial cells and transported into the tumor tissues. For example, in this example, um, we are using a cyclic RCD uh, installed uh, polymeric micelles uh, that can recognize the integrins that are overexpressed on the endothelial cells of, of, the, uh, of the tumors. So we can see here only the green color of a cyclic RCD micelles penetrating deep into the tumor position, whereas the control cyclic RAD micelles are just remaining in the vascular space. So based on these formulations, uh, uh, New clinical trials have started uh, in combination with immunotherapy, particularly two formulations loading anti-cancer drugs are being uh, studied in combination with uh, Keytruda, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor for a PD-1 uh, target. So the first one is a polymeric micelles that incorporate cisplatin in their core. Uh, the formulation is very simple, just a block of polymer with a polyglutamic acid that combined with cisplatin forms alpha helical structures in the core that are quite stable uh, in physiological environment and will release the drug selectively at the tumor position. The other formulation is a polymeric mice that is loaded with an anti-cancer drug uh, called epirubicin. Uh, it's a very potent anthracycline that will also have an immunogenic effects uh, when killing the, uh, the cancer cells. So both drugs, both, both polymeric micelles are designed to be activated at the intratumoral environment uh, by the acidic pH of tumors. So the goal of these uh, uh, clinical trials is to increase the uh, overall response rate of uh, immunotherapy and present a synergistic effect against the tumors. So currently, the overall response rate to uh, uh, immunotherapy is less than 20%, and there is my, much uh, interest in to increase these values to, to uh, improve the, the survival and the quality of life of patients. So one way to improve uh, the efficacy of immunotherapy is to convert the tumors from uh, a cold microenvironment with a 
low infiltration of anti-tumor immune cells into a hot inflammatory uh, phenotype with a high infiltration of uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells and uh, natural killer cells that will uh, promote the elimination of uh, cancer cells and uh, lead to uh, robust therapeutic responses. So one way to do this change from cold into hot tumor microenvironment is to use an anti-cancer drug that promotes immunogenic cell death like uh, epirubicin. So once the cells are uh, affected by the anti-cancer drug, they will release um, molecules that will be recognized by antigen-presenting cells to trigger a potent immune response against the tumors. So in the case of glioblastoma, the immune suppression is um, very notable. So the, the need for inducing uh, a hot tumor is uh, long sought for improving the efficacy of immunotherapies. So particularly uh, a recent uh, a report in Nature Medicine has indicated that uh, the beta mutations in tumors are correlated with a high degree of immunosuppression and uh, resistance to uh, PD-1 blockade, like uh, that from Keytruda. So we thought about using our epirubicin micelle to induce immunogenic cell death in models of glioblastoma having pitten mutations and uh, a wild type pitten to see the effect of, uh, of the uh, combination therapies. So we applied these polymeric micelles to two types of uh, uh, glioblastoma cells, one that is uh, PTEN positive, GL261, and one that is PTEN negative, CT2A. And we observed that uh, the polymeric micelle is able to achieve efficient induction of immunogenic cell death as measured by the calreticulin exposure on the surface of the, of the cancer cells. So when we move into in vivo studies, we observed that in, in the PTEN positive mice that are sensitive to uh, anti-PD-1 treatment, uh, the combination therapy leads to complete reg regression of the tumor. So all the mice were cured after uh, combination treatment with the polymeric micelle and the antibodies. On the other hand, when we use uh, the PIT and negative tumor, the antibodies are, the anti-PD-1 antibodies are not effective uh, against this tumor model, indicating the resistance to the, to the immunotherapy. However, when we use the combination therapy of epirubicin micelles and anti pd one antibodies, we are able to eradicate 90% of the tumors. So this high efficacy is also correlated with the increased infiltration of immune cells that will lead to a effective immune response in, in this uh, tumor model. So we observe a high number of uh, CD8 positive cells infiltrating in these tumors, as well as a higher uh, CD8 to FOXP3 uh, ratio, which corresponds to uh, cytotoxic T cells to regulatory T cells present in the tumors. By doing a rechallenging experiment uh, with a, a re inoculation of the cancer cells into the brain of mice, we confirmed that. Uh, our treatments can induce a potent uh, immunological memory against uh, the cancer cells, as uh, in the case of the pitten positive tumors, uh, all the mice were able to, all the mice treated with epirubicin micelle uh, plus PD-1 were able to eradicate the tumors, and uh, five out of six were able to eradicate uh, the tumors in the, in the, the pitten negative uh, tumor model. Besides increasing the efficacy and synergizing with uh, anti-PD-1, the pyruvicin loaded micelles were also able to reduce the systemic immunosuppression uh, of chemotherapy. So in the case of epirubicin uh, administered in a free form, we observe a decrease in, on the thymus weight, the spleen weight, and also a decrease in the white blood cell count. However, when we use the epirubicin micelles, we observe that these weights are uh, much higher, and uh, by histology uh, evaluation, we observed uh, much less damage 
in, in thymus and in spleen when we use the polymeric mycelles. So besides loading uh, small molecules, we can also uh, uh, attempt to deliver other payloads that will have a, a higher specificity or uh, improved functionality for treating uh, tumors and uh, improving the efficacy of immunotherapies. So as an example, I, I'll show you a recent approach to deliver proteins. So particularly, uh, antibodies have had a hard time to improve um, the survival in, in brain. And this is mainly uh, in brain tumors. And this is mainly because of uh, the poor penetration into, into the malignant tissues in, in the brain due to the blood-brain tumor barrier. So the, the tumors in the brain will present a very uh, impermeable endothelial wall that will limit the access of macromolecules into the tumor position. So in, in particularly the anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL1 antibodies uh, has not been um, effective against the glioblastoma in the clinic. So if we could improve this uh, delivery of immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other antibodies into uh, glioblastoma, we should we would be able to improve the efficacy and the therapeutic outcomes uh, of the treatments. So a notable point about the vasculature and the microenvironment of uh, the glioblastoma is that uh, the endothelial cells and the cancer cells overexpress a glucose transporter one. So if we design a drug delivery system that is able to engage with the glucose transporter one and the endothelial cells, we would be able to promote the transport into the tumor position and increase uh, the accumulation of the antibodies to exert the therapeutic effects. So to demonstrate this uh, approach, we use uh, anti pd one antibodies, uh, namely uh, avelumab, and we modify these antibodies with a, a polymer uh, called polyethylene glycol. This is a clinically approved polymer. And we introduce uh, glucose moieties at the end group of these uh, polyethylene glycols. So these glucose moieties will interact with the glucose transporter. The polyethylene glycol will provide a stealth functionality. And we will use a linker that it's activated at the intertumoral space by the reductive conditions. So when the antibody that is uh, conjugated with this polymer enters the tumor microenvironment, the reductive conditions will cleave the bond between the polymer and the antibody to retrieve the original avelumab. So we anticipate that this antibody will work in the, in the following fashion. They, it will engage with the glucose transporter one, access the tumor microenvironment to release fully activated abelumab to engage with the uh, cancer cells to promote the uh, immunotherapy. So we test this uh, antibody modified with the polymers and the, the antibody having the glucose and the reduction sensitive bond is able to uh, eradicate 60% of the tumor after just a, a single shot at a 50% of the dose of uh, uh, that is commonly used in the clinic. So by using this delivery system, we are able then to improve the efficacy of, of the treatment. So this efficacy of the treatment is also correlated with a higher infiltration of anti-tumor immune cells like CDA cells, natural killer cells, and also the uh, higher expression of interferon gamma, which correlates with a potent uh, immune response. Besides the anti-tumor immune cells, we also have a decrease on the immunosuppressive cells in the tumor microenvironment, like regulatory T cells or uh, MSC uh, cells from monocytic or granulocytic origin. Besides the M2-like macrophages are also reduced when we use the glucose-installed uh, macrophages, uh, glucose-installed antibodies, sorry. 
when we rechallenged the surviving mice with a second inoculation of uh, uh, cancer cells in the brain, we observed that uh, 80% uh, of the mice uh, is able to suppress the, the tumor regrowth. So this confirms a potent induction of uh, immunological memories uh, in these animals. So to confirm the mechanism of uh, the penetration and activation of the antibodies in the tumors, we perform a detailed analysis of each step. So first we uh, evaluated how the antibodies were increasing the accumulation when, we're, when they were combined with the, with the glucose moieties on the polymers. So this is a tumor section from a orthotopic uh, brain tumor. And we can see that uh, the endothelial cells in these tumors are also highly overexpressing uh, glucose uh, transporter one, and that the antibodies modified with the glucose uh, polymers are able to penetrate deeply into the, into the tumor tissue. So this deep penetration leads to a higher accumulation compared to the uh, antibodies uh, without, uh, uh, without glucose. So here in black, we have the uh, native abelumab. In blue is the modified abelumab without glucose. And in red, we have uh, the modified abelumab with glucose. So we have an 18 fold increase in the accumulation at the tumor position. And if we compare to the accumulation uh, with the normal brain uh, tissue, we have a 30 fold increase uh, compared uh, to, the, to the healthy tissue. Besides the increased accumulation, we also check for the intratumoral activation by the reductive environment. First, we check this uh, by doing in vitro studies where we have uh, our modified abelumab and after conjugating with uh, glutathione, which is a reductive molecule that is present in tumors, the native uh, abelumab is uh, retrieved. And this uh, retrieved abelumab after incubation with glutathione presents a comparable binding uh, affinity like uh, the original uh, abelumab. Besides, when we uh, incubate this uh, abelumab uh, with the cancer cells, we can see the binding of the first and label antibody to the to the cells, and this with uh, the glutathione retreatment, we can also follow the, the binding to the, to the cell membrane, but not for the uh, pegylated antibody. We also observe the similar activation in vivo. Uh, if we don't have the cleavable bond, we don't have a activation of the antibodies at the tumor position, but if we have the cleavable bond, we can retrieve the binding of the antibodies to the cancer cells in the intratumoral microenvironment. Besides increasing efficacy, we can also reduce side effects by uh, using this drug delivery system. And this is a, a major, uh, a, this is of major interest for the uh, treatment of patients as 14% of patients will suffer from immune related adverse events when treated with abelumab. So by using the same method to detect the activation in the, tum in the tumor, we follow the activation in lung, liver, or kidney. Abelumab be fully active and binds with the cells in these organs. However, the pegylated antibody, the polymer-modified antibody is not able to bind with the cells in the healthy tissues. By looking into the immune cell infiltration in the organs, and also the cytokine release, we can see that the uh, immune activation and uh, inflammation response in the healthy tissues is uh, greatly suppressed, and we can have a much safer uh, treatment. So besides glioblastoma, we have also confirmed that the same delivery system works uh, in other tumors. So here is an example of a melanoma uh, after just one injection of the modified Abelumab, um, we can have a complete uh, tumor regression of, uh, of the uh, tumors within two weeks. Uh, on the other hand, even three shots of free abelumab 
is not able to to achieve such significant anti-tumor effect. So with this, I would like to finish. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the members of my laboratory, particularly Mr. Chen, and also the members of uh, Professor Kataoka Laboratory at the Innovation Center of Nanomedicine, uh, particularly Dr. Uh, Tao Yang, who did the studies on uh, depegylated antibodies. Besides, I would like to thank the funding agencies and uh, private collaborators that uh, make all this research possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cabral, for uh, this uh, talk that says how um, nanomedicine can improve the um, availability of drugs within the body by reducing also the side effects. So now, I mean, Professor Mantovani just said, said that uh, we, before we had just fillers before the rock star, I don't think that the previous doors were simply fillers. Uh, they still reach the stardom status. But of course, now we will have uh, the talk of uh, Professor Tasuku Honjo, who is a Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine for 2018. He's the deputy director general and distinguished professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies at uh, the Kyoto University and the director center for uh, uh, the director of the Center for Cancer Immunotherapy and Immunobiology at the Gra Graduate School of Medicine, always at the uh, Kyoto University. So Professor Honjo, now the floor is yours. Professor Honjo, probably you are, you are muted. Uh, We cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Now, oh, okay. that's fine. Now it's okay. okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much for a kind invitation and also a nice introduction. Uh, I'm also very much uh, uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, I I'm sorry. I changed all schedule because of the kind of sudden accident in Shinkansen. So I, I was stuck in the Nagoya station for hours. Now it's okay, uh, I can start under the title of Future Perspective Cancer Immunotherapy. I just focus on the adaptive immunity, uh, which uh, is part of the topic, but not whole topic of cancer immunotherapy. Uh, so, this is a very simply oversimplified cartoon how killer T cells uh, recognize uh, cancer antigens. And this activation leads to migration of cells, T cells, to the uh, first activation takes place in the draining lymph node and then migrate to the target the tumor cells, and there killing actually happens. However, this process depends on the two regulatory mechanisms. One is ARC cell, like CD28 on the lymphocyte, and break represented by PD1, also CD4, and, and many others, but major players are C34 and PD-1 as a break. And this regulation compete with each other. But uh, what we have shown is the blockade of the break can strikingly augment capacity of CD8 T cells and leading the tumor killing. So, this uh, strategy has been approved in clinic. And since the first approval of melanoma 2014, we have more than two dozens of tumors with the same drug and many different types of tumors. So this strategy also gave very strong impact 
to the cancer treatment at the three points. One is less adverse effects because normal cells are not affected. This break is mostly expressed immune systems, some innate immunity cells, others are mostly adaptive immunity, T and B cells. Secondary, as I just mentioned, effective for wide range of tumors and still many other uh, clinical trials going on on different targets. Thirdly, and most importantly, the response is durable. Many cases, the, when the patient respond, and then uh, it's better to stop, not continue forever to avoid any side effects. But still, even you stop the treatment, the immune system, once get activated, continue to attack tumors and tumor size uh, continue to be shrink. And why this happens? As you know, this is because most of the tumors extensively studied by uh, cancer genome projects. And they found accumulation of mutation in coding regions as well as non-coding regions. And just counting coding region mutations, uh, mutation frequency is 1,000 to 10,000 fold compared to normal cells. So this serves as neoantigen. That means cancer cell originate from our own, but eventually it's become non-self. And that's why immune cells can recognize as non-self or invaders and attack. The variety of mutation accumulation, and most of the cases, the leukemia least accumulate mutation because often they have very drastic chromosomal translocation or other uh, less number of hit can induce leukemia. So what do we learn from this uh, extensive cancer genome study? Uh, number one, cancer cells accumulate a large number of mutations to express neoantigen, which I just explained. But secondly, this is probably most important. Too many mutations. And also, tumors are not a single clone. It's accumulation of many mutants. And therefore, it's very difficult to pinpoint dominant mutations for targeted chemotherapy. So like this, cancer cells a mixture of many clones with different mutations and drugs aimed for blue cells, kill the blue cells, but the re remaining cell, yellow, green, or red, survive. And another target aimed to yellow, remove the yellow cells, but other cells still survive and eventually expand. And unfortunately, adaptive immunity lymphocytes can recognize many antigens and all these mutated cells are non-self and therefore they can attack. However, the current strategy is far from the perfect. We don't know who actually respond until we try. So this is a big problem. There are only two aspects. One is whether tumors are rich in mutations. This is a very important because the higher the neoantigen accumulation, easier the T cells get activated. The other aspect, which is far more difficult, as you can see from COVID-19 cases, 
each individual respond enormously diversity. So this is the same for tumors and each individual's uh, immune capacity is very difficult to assess simply by DNA sequencing or selection of few markers. Still, this is a mystery. So we have to improve the capacity of immune cells from two aspects. One is accessibility. For example, pancreatic cancer are very difficult because uh, accessibility of lymphocyte to the locus is probably limited. We are uh, approaching from the second aspect, namely, we like to prom, uh, enhance the capacity of killer function and how we can do it. Uh, there are many, many trials. Actually, this is the almost all combination uh, partner with PD-1 blockade. So number one is CTL4 blockade, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and angiogenesis inhibitors. But this is the uh, cartoon of uh, 2019, but I'm pretty sure this number enormously expanded up to 2021. So, like to introduce totally different aspects. Why we get the cancer? We think it's because our immune capacity goes down after puberty. And when we reach my stage, the right end of this cartoon, our immune capacity is very limited. And with mirror image, we see the increase of cancer cases. So my proposal, or not all, my own theory, many immunologists think reduction of immune capacity is at least in part responsible for increase of the cancer incidence. And why this happens? It's obvious, after puberty, we lose our thymus, the organ which generates T lymphocytes. So when you age, you cannot produce T lymphocytes, very little, if any. But bone marrow stem cell continue to survive. Therefore, we have new B lymphocytes but not T lymphocytes. So this causes big problem. But surprisingly, we have relatively constant number of T cells in our body, even aged. How this is possible? One idea is our lymphocyte are very mildly activated by own antigen, self-antigen. It's very mild, so it's good enough just divide once per week, I don't know, uh, very slowly, but enough to maintain the number of cells. So under that condition, why our immune capacity goes down, even though we have significant number of T lymphocytes. A is this strategy is not enough to maintain our huge repertoire. Since we don't have newly generated T lymphocyte, there might be some holes in our repertoire to cover all the antigens. The second idea is because of self-antigen stimulation, whole immune system is try to be suppressed to avoid autoimmunity, which is the case. So this is the cartoon I'm saying homeostatic proliferation 
meaning in the absence of thymus, T cells have to be uh, renewed, not in central organ, but in periphery. And there, self antigen play a role and slow proliferation to maintain the population and repertoire. So the question is whether we have a holes in repertoire or the threshold of activation is up. So therefore our immune function is defective. Actually, most of the animal experiments against the tumor uh, treatment done in young mice. And actually human patients in most of the cases aged. So this is a big difference. So this slide shows in young animals, anti-PD-1 treatment, the tumor is, I believe, MC138, which is colon cancer, is very effective. However, when we use aged animal, 60 months or older, antibody doesn't work. Same dose, same tumor number. So clearly, aged animals are defective in the immune capacity to kill the tumor. So we switched to PD-1 knockout because somebody say your antibody is not good. So in this case, since this is knockout, they don't have any break. So please look at the blue aged animal, even absence of break, they cannot stop the growth of tumor, although young animals can completely suppress. And also their survival clear is different. So this is not a problem of the antibody and clearly aged mice has some problem. So uh, we tested what's the difference between aged and young. And we found actually on this uh, fax analysis, uh, CD44, CD62L plot makes the whole CD8 population into four. One naive, uh, P1 naive, P2 central memory, P3 effector memory, P4 actually uh, there is no good name so far. We just call P4. And this population has not been studied extensively yet because this is very minor population. Uh, we took this from spleen. And uh, you can see uh, this P4 population, which we isolated, injected into CD8 knockout animals, which do not have any killer T cells. And we injected each population, P1, P2, P3, and you can see on the left side, P3, P1, P4, almost uh, equally can suppress tumor growth. Without CD8, a white circle, of course, the tumor continue to grow. So this means P1, P2, P3, and P4 all have capacity to fight against the tumor. And then the major difference, I forgot to say, in aged animal, P4 population is much reduced. So we wanted to revive these aged animals. And we learned in vitro, P1 can generate P4 by activation. So we thought the second hypothesis I mentioned, the threshold of activation is limited in aged animals. So to overcome this, we may give very strong stimulation, in this case, xenoantigen. So we use human 
tumor cell. Uh, Burkitt lymphoma cells injected, da uh, sorry, Dowdy, yeah, Dowdy cells injected. And you can see in the young animals, uh, you can easily suppress tumor growth in PD-1 knockout condition. But in aged animals, if you give Dowdy cells non-specific, very strong xeno antigen, it can suppress. and also prolong their survival. And uh, this is not only genetic knockout, but antibody treatment as well. Young animals, of course, but even aged animals, which do not respond anti PD-1 alone, but combination of Dowdy, they now see the tumor suppression on your right-hand slide. So we want to go into the clinic and Xeno is a little bit too harsh. So we decided to use Allo. So in this case, the bulb C uh, splenocyte was irradiated and injected into the B6 mice. Young mice, no problem. But most importantly, this is antibody treatment. And in aged animal, antibody is useless. But now with allo antigen, irradiate splenocyte from different strain of mice can induce tumor suppression. So from this data, we think aging has some limitation of activation from naive cell to P4. In that population, we have shown, I don't show you today in our paper, the cell proliferation and differentiation is very active and one carbon metabolism is strongly activated. And that allows uh, T lymphocyte differentiation into effector and memory cells and works for anti-tumor immunity. So uh, as I explained at the beginning, we conclude reduced sensitivity to antigenic stimulation is the cause of aged uh, immune deficient status. So we check the uh, history of clinical trial and found allogenic tumor cells have been given to patient as a vaccine. So this is feasible clinical trial and we are now planning to give allo or uh, white blood cells irradiated and to the cancer patient who is together with PD-1. So finally, I'd like to add one more aspect uh, of our research. In a minute, we have been working on the class switch recombination and somatic hypermutation, which is a principle of vaccination. And vaccination induced enzyme called the AID in B lymphocyte, which is the enzyme to carry out the, these two genetic alterations. And this enzyme in B cells and the PD-1 T cells are essential to regulate appropriate antibody production, and which are essential for gut microbiota homeostasis. And the final statement I want to say is immune system is very complex and we still don't understand the whole picture, but it's important we should uh, consider this dynamic uh, multi-regulatory system interaction. Uh, 
Dr. Fag Allison uh, in Riken showed PD-1 deficiency also or strong uh, PD-1 blockade can cause enormous metabolic imbalance in blood and including reduction of uh, tyrosine or tryptophan and leading to the brain uh, neurotransmitter deficiency and of course anxiety or fear syndromes. So we have to understand cancer immunology, not just the tumor alone, but as a whole picture. So I'd like to thank my collaborators in Kyoto University. Uh, this picture was taken just after I got the phone call from Stockholm. So everybody looked happy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Honjo, for this nice uh, uh, overview of what should be the future steps for improving the efficacy of uh, cancer immunotherapy. And I also thank you again for having solved brilliantly the problem of the Shinkansen <laughs> that really, I mean, uh, the Shinkansen never breaks <laughs> usually. So that's obviously just today with you on board, it's the <laughs> right day for having the train broken. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we move to the um, to the um, round table. So I would like to to start the discussion. I mean, we are we have listened uh, fantastic science. Uh, we have listened a variety of possible uh, tricks that we, we can make to tumor in the future. But reality is that tumor is still one of the major causes of uh, uh, mortality, and it's very per pervasive. I mean, basically everybody in the world was touched directly by a tumor or some of his relatives of his friends uh, suffer from this disease. So uh, when we talk about uh, tumor, we need also to be very careful in not giving um, expectations to people, because when people listen to new things, they just may believe that uh, the, uh, the future drugs and the, the future rescue for the patient is tomorrow. And it's still not the case. So we need to uh, be responsible also in, in, in this direction. So uh, what I would like, I mean, therefore, I mean, I would, I would like to start the discussion by talking how and when, uh, especially when, in which time frame we may, uh, have uh, uh, widespread uh, uh, efficacy of new drugs. Uh, uh, and also, for instance, uh, uh, Professor Honjo said that uh, cancer immunotherapy is already on, uh, the already clinical trials have been made and it's given uh, to patients already, but the cost of the therapy at this moment is uh, prohibitive. So we need also to think that uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the therapy to be effective, especially in, in uh, develop, uh, developing countries, the cost cannot be so high. So I would like you uh, to start with, uh, with this consideration. So, and uh, I'd like to start with Professor Honjo for this, uh, starting with hearing with his comments on that. Yes, uh, the cost problem uh, would be probably easier to be solved compared to the increase in the efficacy of the treatment. I've already heard a number of uh, companies uh, making the substitute of antibody with the low molecules and also some cheaper antibody uh, which can, can be produced in such as E. coli or in yeast, like nanobody, which is more efficient. So this uh, is uh, just a matter of time. But whether we can increase the efficacy of this treatment from 20 to 30% to over 50%, 60 to 70, that may take longer time. And uh, I know, thousands of groups, companies, academia, 
all very eager to improve this uh, well combination is certainly the most popular strategy but i'm pretty sure many people uh, have all different idea not just uh, adaptive immunity but also innate immunity and so that's my feeling so if you ask me when it's possible it's very difficult uh, only thing i can say is we don't have to completely remove tumors if tumor stops growing at certain stage that's fine most of the elderly people for them they if they stop growing and stay there it's not a serious problem but so that's my feeling thank you very much yes i agree with you that uh, uh, the problem of uh, relapse sometimes is uh, mm -hmm. It's, I mean, the, the new start is, is the most serious problems of the traditional therapy. Uh, Professor Mantovani, can you please comment on this uh, topic? Yeah, I think that with uh, cancer immunotherapy, we entered a new, a new continent and with fantastic vistas, as uh, Tasuko Onjo said, uh, there are uh, other checkpoints in T cells, checkpoints in um, uh, in NK cells, checkpoints in monocytes. Cell therapy is is a challenge. So I think that, and we will proceed uh, uh, step by step. Uh, concerning the the point of uh, having sustainable uh, approaches, of course, is is uh, as as was said. I mean, it's. That can be handled in 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 the in our countries. Uh, we can handle that. I my concern is developing countries and and COVID nineteen uh, is an. Let me tell you a story. In the last uh, couple of weeks, I was part of of a meeting, a think tank, and uh, someone, Bernie Fox, was there from CITSI, which is a major cancer immunotherapy organization, mainly in U in US, uh, and an umbrella organization. And uh, I was, I, I, I had served, I've served as, as president of the International Union of Immunological Societies and CITSI and, and IUIS had planned to do something in, in, in Africa together. Uh, and COVID has, uh, prevented it from happening and we, we said when are we going back there because we should not forget that cancer i mean of course is the second or first cause of death in our countries but there is a a, a forgotten cancer epidemics uh in uh low-income countries so i think that uh, we have uh, a number of challenges in terms of of science and can I ask a specific question to, uh, to Tazuko Honjo? <laughs> uh, and, and we have a, a, a general issue of, of sharing vaccines, sharing cancer immunotherapy to, uh, with uh, low-income countries. I have, a, there, is a major, there are major differences in, uh, related to gender in response to, uh, to checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. And, and there are differences in the tumor microenvironment. There was a recent paper by Fabio Conforti and Giuseppe Giacone at uh, Pelicis Institute. I was on, the, on that paper because I gave a minor contribution to that, but it's really their paper. And I want to quote because I think it's a fantastic paper. Uh, it's in publishing in clinical cancer. Well. And it's amazing. There, were, there are major differences in the in the in the cells that infiltrate non-small cell lung cancer between males and females i mean i was shocked by that and the difference in response i wonder whether tazuko has any thought of, on, on that because we should not forget that age is important but gender is also very important yes uh, i have not experienced myself but it's quite reasonable because the hormones a strong effect on the immune system 
you know, uh, that's part of the uh, game of COVID-19, vaccine side effects and also symptom itself, clear difference between male and female. So I am not surprised when you see the different uh, cell infiltration or other phenotypes in tumors between the male and female. Thank you very much. So since uh, we are calling it a gender issue, so I will ask Lina to comment on that. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? So it's not my field, uh, even though I'm the only lady here today. Um, uh, but I think it's very, it's very interesting because of, well, there is another gender issue in tumor that I, well, it's not my, my field, but it's something that really uh, um, made me so curious. Carcinoma are twice as much frequent in men rather than women. And uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, effect of uh, androgen receptors uh, in carrying out signaling, pro-tumoral signaling. Of course, androgens are uh, uh, differently, uh, um, have different levels in men and women. And uh, I'm surprised that this issue is not so uh, um, often treated. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a curiosity that I have. And since you, <laughs> you challenge me on this point. This is uh, years that I'm thinking of this. Um, but uh, uh, apart from this, let me uh, take some of the words of uh, Professor Andrew at the beginning, uh, because I, at the beginning of this, of the round table, because I think it's very important what he said about how to manage tumors. So it's coming out that keeping a tumor in a dormant or uh, uh, anyway, un, un, uh, uh, um, not dangerous state uh, is, a, is a very important solution. And this is something that is coming out. This would be very important that uh, when a therapy, the efficacy of a therapy is uh, considered, uh, would, an emphasis would be given to this point because many, many times uh, the objective molecular and cellular status is considered as a priority with respect to the clinical effect. Uh, this is something, of course, it's, I'm not a clinician, but I'm keeping on hearing clinicians complaining for, for this, especially those attending new uh, um, protocols and new uh, uh, avenues for, for cancer. So I think it's, it's very important. This would be a way of, uh, uh, living with tumors and somehow stabilizing a quality of life uh, for the patients. And I think this is a very important point that is connected also with the, with the cost, because of course, uh, there are so many uh, uh, interests in, uh, in, this, in this point. And um, so uh, uh, a balance between the necessity of the populations to be cured, the necessity of the economy, must be reached. Uh, and I think this is a very, very important challenge in, in, this, uh, in this issue. You want to comment, Professor Honjo, or I could move on? Well, you better move on because this okay. is such a big issue, so we cannot right. cover. <laughs> so, Professor Pellici. Uh, maybe, maybe. The, 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 the issue is really very, very interesting. I, I, I want to briefly comment on the aging and sex issue and then going back to your general question. I mean, uh, it is true that uh, following uh, the clinical observations Alberto was referring to, we're looking at more carefully to uh, sex, uh, uh, gender, I mean, uh, differences. And it is true that if you carefully look at it, I mean, response to checkpoint inhibitors in uh, syngenic versus uh, um, immunosuppressed animals is different in gender in the 
former versus the latter. So in other terms, we do see gender differences in syngenic models, with, which we don't see in uh, immunodepressed mice. And I guess I was very intrigued by Dr. Ono ideas uh, on the aging. If you think about it, I mean, uh, the entire uh, issue of uh, aging in sele during selection is the end of fertility, you know, which makes the turning point of what we call aging as opposed to developmental programs, which are dramatically different in uh, men and uh, females. It would be nice to cross indeed the uh, gender and age uh, issues, if you wanna call them in our experiments and see how much they influence uh, either tumor growth per se and checkpoint inhibitor responses. Very interesting and thank you for these uh, nice insights. I mean, with respect to your general question, I mean, uh, timing and what we should expect, I mean, uh, I'm not going to repeat what others have said, but it's difficult to, to, to make prediction. But something we can say, I mean, uh, all this, I, I think that what happened in the last 20 years is a real revolution. And that revolution is entirely based on research. There is no question about it. Fundamental research, fundamental understanding of mechanism underlying cancer development. And... Uh, I guess that uh, if we now face the need of uh, pursuing that avenue to, to obtain uh, further improvements, the ways of research, and uh, I guess this uh, is not sufficiently realized by our, uh, I mean, uh, stakeholders or policymakers and so on, we, we do need uh, a major effort in uh, fundamental research, in my opinion, in the next uh, decades, if we want to improve further, is uh, amazing. Thanks to Dr. Onjo for his contribution and all the scientific community. But, I mean, the, what we have seen with metastatic cancer in the last five years, we never saw it before. I mean, this is uh, undoubted. The last thing I want to say is, uh, I mean, uh, I agree then. I mean, that's what I personally <laughs> have done during my whole career is to intensify research efforts for the future. But there is an issue, I think, that uh, Alberto was quickly alluding to, which should be also discussed. How much of the available uh, knowledge goes to all patients? I mean, how many patients indeed can access innovation in the world? I'm not talking only, and of course also, to the poor country, but also in the rich countries. How many cancer patients are screened thereby offered the possibility of uh, a new drug. I mean, even for PDL one or PD-1 screening, if you don't want to think to whole genome sequencing for uh, mutational burden and so on. I mean, I tried to, to understand it for Italy and I was never able to get a number. There are a couple of papers from the US where the, the fraction of patients which is uh, uh, actually screened for the aim of stratification to new drugs is around 20%. So, okay, so we have an issue of accessing innovation by the world. The low income world clearly is not accessing innovation, but also within so-called high income civilized or whatever you wanna call it countries, uh, I guess that access, access to innovation is still too much limited. So we don't have only to improve therapies, but we should also make them available to everybody. Thank you very much. I agree very much with this point. And, and also for making this available, also we need to mm -hmm. reduce costs. <laughs> That's which also yeah, but I guess it's not the only... I, I totally no, no, agree. I agree. Which is, it's not the only issue. It's not, it's the, not the only, only issue. issue. It's not the only issue. Also because we're talking about antibodies. Dr. Onio was very lucid in his answer. I mean, 
there are perspectives of price reduction. There is no question about it. It, it happened in the past for other things. So price is an issue, clearly. But I guess it's not the only one. Oh, yes, also genetic uh, screening, uh, the cost of genetic screening is going down and down. So now it's, uh, yeah, exactly. before it was uh, prohibitive, now it's accessible. It will happen. So uh, let's uh, go to Horacio. So let's, I want to hear your comments on that. And, but I would like also to ask you some more specific question. So nanomedicine uh, is, has a lot of promises. Probably the promises have not been fulfilled yet from, uh, I mean, from bedside, let's say. So it's not so many are, are going yes. really into application. So what do you think are the reasons of this and how we can overcome this problem? Yes, yeah, so following the same uh, perspective shared by the professor, so screening is a major component of uh, cancer treatment. And uh, as we move into the progress of nanomedicine in clinical studies, we, we understand that uh, screening methods are necessary to understand which patients can benefit from nanomedicine. So we, we understand now that the permeability of tumors is uh, variable, that not all patients will have a permeable cancer that can lead to the accumulation of, uh, of nanomedicines. So uh, biomarkers are still elusive and uh, probably the most uh, useful approach is to um, identify uh, permeability of tumors by imaging. Um, so in, in our group, for example, we are looking into approaches that can uh, overcome the differences in permeability and use other mechanisms to, to deliver the drugs into the tumors uh, with high efficiency. But uh, still they are on the, uh, on the research in preclinical models, not, not still for translation into humans. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are unfortunately run out of time. The, the, the topics to discuss would be many, and uh, but uh, I, I'd like to wrap up first of all by thank you all of you for uh, this uh, amazing list of uh, scientific work and uh, for the very nice discussion that followed. So I uh, basically. As, as I said before, everybody, and I also was touched by cancer in the, in the dark with my mother, passed away of cancer. And uh, uh, so this is, I saw, I followed her chemotherapy and um, definitely it was not the best way for rescue life. So I really believe that for, uh, uh, for a rescuing patient, we need to change the paradigm and uh, investigating a new uh, way for uh, addressing the, 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 the tumor. And of course, this way is research and uh, biology, understanding the mechanism so that we can find the right targets and, uh, and uh, not, not just giving a kick to the television for let it turn uh, on again. So I thank you very much again. I hope that this will be a fruitful discussion also for future research and research on future collaboration. Uh, for instance, this gender issue, there's a, a deeper investigation of that would be really, really interesting. And uh, so I, I'll close the webinar here, thanking you again, and thank you all the audience for attending this. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.